So blessed evening to each one of us, brothers and sisters. Again, it's so it is a day of fellowship. It is a day that designed by the Lord. So thanks be to God for all those testimonies. Let me just greet you a warm welcome. And again, how blessed in the eyes of the Lord that each believers will come and join together in the fellowship. So as we all know, brothers and sisters, we are still in the book, the study of the book of 1 John. And the book of 1 John, for sure, it challenges us to have a practical way of living as a child of God. And we all know, and who cannot forget, forget the convicting, the nourishing, and confronting preaching for last week by our beloved Pastor Fitz. And for sure, it still reminds us that really, it is good and nice to hear the word of God or the power of God that comes from the living God. So my dear brothers and sisters, we are now in part eight. Now tell me, uh, is my slide is moving? Mga kapatid, can you thumbs up, please? Nagbumu po ba? Ah, ah, okay. Hindi po ba nagbumu? Yan. So in second part po, mga kapatid, we are now in part yan. Part 8, the test of knowing Christ. And the test of knowing Christ simply means, well, challenges us on how deep our relationship to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yan, mas maganda. Okay, thank you. Now, the next is, our main passage for today, if you have your Bible, please open it in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Thank you. Let's read, mga kapatid. If you have your Bible, and let's read it. Ready? 1, 2, 3. Read. My little children, I am writing these things so that you may not sin. And anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation of our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the world. Let's pray for a moment. Most gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Lord, we ask for divine wisdom. We ask for knowledge, anointing. Give us a teachable heart, Lord God, for those people hearing this message. Lord, I pray and I ask, don't just change us. Also, Lord, challenge us on how we live a life glorifying and Christ exalting in your name. I ask this, Lord, for the glory and the power of your name in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So as my introduction, did you know that while I'm preparing my sermon, I miss uh, my previous job? And we all know that it was 2017 to 2019 when I worked before at Qatar as a quality a control inspector, mga kapatid, it's so nice. And sometimes uh, I really asked, why is it the life of a concrete will experience various testing? So next slide, please. You will notice there if in, uh, sorry, no, uh, the title of this message is the test of knowing Christ. So you will see in your screen that there are several tests that the concrete will about to experience. Now, when I was working in Qatar and one of the famous no, uh, uh, highway that used or constructed by Qatar government is the national or the uh, orbital highway. So when we did this board piling foundation, there are a lot of things that I've learned. Now, for example, in board piling, we will have to experience this mechanical caliper lagging test. We also test what we call a high and low strain integ integrity test and even the ultrasonic crossed hole testing. Now, for sure, in a technical sense, our engineers, our poor man working in this job site understand what I'm talking about. But please bear with me in order to understand what this test is all about. And yet, in spite of those series of testing, is it necessary? So that's the question here. Now, upon concrete pouring, 
there is also what we call a compression test based on the concrete sample of the cube test because that sample will serve as a representation of what the concrete to be poured to a particular structure. And there is what we call the slam test and also what we call a sampling testing. So for sure, some of you are familiar with this one. Next slide, please. Not only that, we only did what we call a dynamic load test. After the concrete pouring, when it become you know, solid, no, the board pile will, can, will undergo dynamic load test in order to determine that indeed the specific strength really attained based on the mixed design that it was being designed. So if you will see there, while, you know, while I'm preparing the sermon, I really miss Qatar, you know, I really miss all of you. And I also really miss working in my old, old profession. But you know, when, when, when things go, go differently, the, he, this is now a full-time uh, pastor. But again, it's nice to, to remember those uh, experiencing. Otherwise, if I did not able to come up this one, I did not meet you all of you there. So there you do uh, dynamic load test. Not only that, next slide please. Did you know that when I searched in the internet, I was shocked in a little way that when I noticed the free gene, if you remember, the free gene is a big company installing a cantilever. So the cantilever is the one that will, you know, where the signages we're going to put. Next slide, please. This is the, the picture of that. So you will notice there along that area for sure, because this I was assigned to inspect that. So I, I, I took a picture with that before it will uh, open for the public. So I realized, oh, because whenever it will install, the quality uh, control inspector like me will go there in order to supervise that it is indeed uh, doing well. And you know that after doing a series of tests, this is now the, the outcome of that cantilever or some gantries. If you will go there in new orbital highway, all the road signs, all the marks there, I am the one that checking on it. Now, this is the product after all those testing. This is now the final outcome. This is one. The next slide, please. Putting now the road signs. Yeah, and this is the one. So you will see, not totally perfect on the left side, but on the right side, it becomes clear, it becomes good, and it gives now a clear direction. My fellow brethren in the Lord, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying this one, the epistle of John is the letter that filled with a series of tests in order to determine the genuineness of our Christian life. Did you know that in, ja in chapter one alone, you will see or we will see a test of confession. We, you will notice that in 1 John chapter one, verses six to 10, the test of confession. Next slide, please. Verse nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from our all our unrighteousness. You will see there a test of confession. Secondly is a test of obedience. John chapter 2 or first John chapter 2 it says in verse 5, but anyone obeys his word, a love for God truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. What's the second test? The test of obedience. Now, the third one is the test of love. First John, uh, first John chapter 2, verse 10, it says, Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister in the darkness and walks around in the darkness, they do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. And what's the fourth test is the test of truth. This is 1 John chapter 2 alone. First, notice in 1 John chapter 2 verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy Spirit and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because 
you know it is and because no lie comes from the truth. What are the series of tests? Confession, obedience, truth, and love. Now, basically, the title of today's message will reflect the test of knowing Christ. So John is preceding a certain comments of inability of sinful behavior. In other words, we commit sin and we cannot avoid it. So in verses 6 and 10 in previous chapter last week, it leads us to assure that indeed we commit sin. However, the avoidance of sin is so important even though it is entirely possible. Mga kapatid, we cannot avoid doing sins. So what is the best thing to do? That's the challenge here. And take note, we keep on repeating, we are not talking about salvation. We are talking about the level or the degree of how you walk in the light on how do you walk with Christ. In other words, having a Christ-like attitude it is always subject to test. And why we need to do or to undergo testing in order to determine that when the result is good, that validates that indeed we are a children of God. So let me give you a three simple outline in today's preaching. First one is the deeds of the saints. We will see that in the first section of verse one. Secondly, the defense of the Savior, and that's the last part in verse one. And thirdly, the, def the death of the Savior. Let's begin. In first outline, the deeds of the saints. Notice he said here, my children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And the word, my little children, you will see there a personal pronoun. Apostle John, in his 90 years, years of age, he is addressing to the believer as if they are his very own. And the word children that is being used here, the word technia, and it emphasizes a family term of endearment. Of course, you as a, a, as a father, sometimes we uh, the, the, the children is calling daddy, mommy, right? So there's a sense of endearment. There's a sense of intimacy there. And the word my, there's a sense of tenderness. Now, when we study it in the Greek, as I've mentioned, that's the word technia. And it corresponds the meaning of the little born ones. Now, how do we, uh, how do we, what we call, correlate it to another writer in the Bible like Apostle Paul? According to Galatians chapter 4, 19, it says here, My little children with whom I am again labor in Christ until Christ will form in you. These are the apostles of the Lord who addresses their spiritual sons. So these terms do not require us to conclude that the recipients were necessarily John's personal converts. It means to say they are not totally have a personal encounter with Apostle John, but as a whole, he addresses them assuming that they have a personal relationship with the Lord. And that's very evident to you and me listening to the word of God today. So, since the letter indicates, it refers to the mature Christians. Why? Because if you will notice, I am writing these things to you. And what are these things that John is writing for us? Remember in our uh, previous months, what are these things? And these are the things concerning Jesus. Letter A, that is what we call the word of life. It was being preached to us in an expositional manner. Another thing is the light, according to 1 John chapter 5. And the Savior who cleanses our sins. So these are the things that he keep on mentioning that these are the things that I'm writing to you that you and I should realize that we are being reminded. And the word so that is the word that speaks of purpose. What's the purpose why John wrote those letters? And last section, you may, see, you may not sin. The problem is, 
take note, brothers and sisters, the reality is we commit sin, and yet he assumed that you will not do sins again. That's impossible. Now, let me share with you. Did you know when you study the word sin, basically in the original Greek word, it is not in the present tense. Did you know that? When we speak of a present tense, it signifies a continuous and unhabitual and we all know as a child of God, we are not doing it. That is why in the original Greek, it means an aorist third tense. It means to say that John is repairing the sin here as a one-time act. He is saying that if you are committing sin, God is saying, uh, sorry, John is saying that God is expecting you to, not, to do not do sins again. Because it is not pleasing to the Lord. This is what John is saying here. So somebody who commits a single act of sin should not do it continuously and habitually. So the word sin in verse 1 alone mentioned twice. And again, both are in aorist third tense that it refers to a one-time act. And take note, brothers and sisters, Sinning is inevitable for sinners, even forgiven sinners like you and me. But in every instance of temptations, there is always the possibility that we will not fall because God gave us insurance that yes, we may fall or we may face temptations, but one thing is for sure, we can able to endure that. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Next is like this. This is what I'm saying, the second mention of the word sin. And if anyone sins, the word if introduces a condition assumed to take place for the sake of argument. Because John understood, yes, we can still sin. So what is the best thing to do? How quick you are to confess those sins whenever we commit sins. So now tell me. How does the Bible declares when we are before who are not yet in Christ? Okay, what is our condition? If anyone sins refers to us, the believers. How does the Bible describe our former condition? And take note, the human character, the condition, or, or the conversation, even the choices that we are making for our previous life, when we are living in darkness, take note, mga kapater, this is a human or spiritual uh, reflection of Paul of what is a total depravity is. This is the product of Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man, one man sin entered into the world and death through sin and so death spread to all men. Because all have sin. This total depravity included a threefold dimension. It affects our mind, our will, and our heart. And Paul's masterpiece in full, uh, in, in full description of in a great logic. Kumbaga, how Paul described. Hindi ko na isa isa yon, but if you will stand and study Romans 3 verses Chapter 3, verses 10 to 17, it affects our mind, our heart, our throat, our tongue, our lips, our mouth, our feet, and even our eyes. The whole human being is sick. So the degree or the tendency to commit sin in a daily basis is hard or it's, it's totally evident for us. That is why even in a single a uh, uh, situation today, you are thinking that you are committing. What time will Pastor Job will finish his sermon? Sort of saying, you are not telling me in a vocal sense, but if you are thinking like that, wait about it. You are now, you might committing sin. Much better to intercede for wisdom for me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So this is the life of the unbeliever, my dearest brothers and sisters. When you study Romans 1.18, to chapter 3:20 that is the composition of the description of what the unbeliever all about and in contrast here what is the life of the believer today so according to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9 
for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So the challenge here is we are sinners, but we already justified. Yet we are still committing sins. Are you with me? You see the problem? Yes, I am being justified by the precious blood of the Lamb. And yet, why is still I am still sinning? Brothers and sisters, even you and Apostle Paul is also struggling that reality. So don't worry about it. That is why, according to his personal testimony in Romans chapter 7, 15 to 20, listen to his testimony. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not what I do not want I want, but I do the very thing I hate. You see the struggle there? Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that it is in the flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the one good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do not want, I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. You have the same sentiments of Apostle Paul? He is doing the things that he don't want to do, but the things he do are the things that is abominable to the Lord. So for sure, you are also experiencing that. Brothers and sisters, as a saints of God, we personally struggling, we personally battling the deeds of the flesh that commits us to sin. So this is the reality, a high tendency to, to commit sins. If you will notice in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. So Paul is comparing on the people who live in the flesh and people who live in the spirit. And those living in the flesh will, will experience death. And those living in spirit will experience life. And there's a very noticeable word, mortipi, mortify or mortification. That's the word mortuary. What does it mean? The word mortuary, those people already died. And those people who have no presence of sin anymore because they are already dead. That's why I, I will keep on saying the struggle of every Christian, we are in the flesh. Indeed, the reality of battling sin is real. So this is the issue that I want you to understand and realize that is why I will keep on mentioning. So the question today is, what we're going to do? How does the role of God in this kind of situations in the life of you and me? Right? This is the issue now. So through the working of God's Holy Spirit, who only dwells in the believers, and we as a believer engages in the process of sanctification or growing in holiness. So as I've said earlier, this is the soteriological term that we need to understand in today's sermon. So this mortification of sin, or as if we are killing sin, it can only serve as an antidote, the word sanctification. Sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit, as if God is the one who calls us, the one that chooses us, and of course, he is the one who sanctifies us. So, brothers and sisters, as an elect of God, as a chosen by God, and of course, as a called by God, you and I are subject for this sanctification. What's the point here? The deeds of the saints, we are still sinning. That leads us into the second point of this outline. The, what we call the defense of our Savior. Ah, now we understand, yes. We commit sin. That is why we need something that will defend in our behalf in God the Father as our judge. The word we have, it refers to you and me. 
it refers to all the believer who put their life trusting to Jesus. Did you know, as you see in the screen, that there is as if in a courtroom session, God the Father is the judge. On the right side is Jesus as our defense attorney, our advocate. On the left side is Satan as the prosecuting attorney, the accuser. And in the center, sitting in the hot seat, the man who is persecute, prosecuted or what we call the accused. So we are in a courtroom session. You are. We are being accused. And who is the accuser? And that's Satan. And we praise God for that. We have an advocate. In other words, Apostle John used a legal term. A legal term as if that we cannot defend our own. So we need a defense attorney, what we call an advocate. And there is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. My dear brothers and sisters, did we all know that yes, we commit sin, that there is something happening in the unseen world. There is something that is protecting us in our holy God. And who is that? According to Hebrews 7.25, Jesus Christ facing God the Father as the righteous judge, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. That's Christ because he always lives to intercede for us. Wow, what a great assurance of these things. So Jesus is keep on saying he is the one protecting us. He is the one defending us of the things that Satan is accusing us. Next uh, slide, please. You will also notice the word advocate is also means helper. And we all know that we keep on saying this is the church. The Trinity reigned beyond harvest. We believe in the doctrine of Trinity. The Father who called us, the, the Son who, who saves us through his blood, and the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us, he is actively participating in our salvation today. That is why the word helper, it simply means paraklite. That's the word in Greek. It is being translated, uh, para means beside. Kaleo means to call. In other words, he is helping beside us. He is the one guiding us. That is why it comes from the English word. We hear this paracetamol, parachute, para, uh, paranormal, parabol, paramedics, and paragraph. In other words, the Holy Spirit in the lives of the believer, he is the one always on our side. That is why what makes us confident that in our Christian life, we will experience victory because it is not us that will control our lives. It is the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Amen? Can you say thumbs up for that? Be, be assured. Blessed assurance. Oh, that's the song. Buti na lang, hindi ako naging worship leader. So according to John 14.26, uh, 14, the promise of the Father but the helper, that's the same term in Greek, parakletos, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and remind you all that I have said to you. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us to help us alongside. The question is, why is it necessary that there is someone to defend us? Against whom? Against Satan. Revelations 12, 12.10, it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. And it says here, The accuser of the brethren, or brothers, and, and, uh, brothers and sisters has been thrown down. The one who accuses before our God day and night. Mm. That's the job of Satan. That's the word jabalos. The devil. That's Satan. He will continuously accuse us like this. Yan ba ang Krisyano? Bakit mahilig pa rin sa online games? Yan ba ang Krisyano ni hindi nga nagdi-disciple ng iba? Is that a Christian yet so harsh to comments on social media? Is that a Christian yet 
still addicted in drugs, gambling and nicotine? Is that a Christian yet so lazy in his own personal de devotion in spite of, the, of those uh, reminder in our Bible reading? Is that a Christian yet he has no appetite in those fellowship? Is that a Christian yet so harsh and so unloving? Is that a Christian yet still visiting a pornographic site? Is that a Christian yet only attend church service and fellowship whenever she or he like? And take note, you are not the master of your life anymore. Is that a Christian yet full of complaint? Is that a Christian who is the founder of a reclamites, a relatives of the Israelites? Brothers and sisters, are you a Christian yet still living in gossiping? That is the things that Satan is doing. Can you poke? Some person beside you, I hope you are not, yet, not, not, not is that one. You are not the one. So Christ Jesus is our defense attorney. Whenever, brothers and sisters, whenever Satan accuses you something, he will not be successful because there is someone that will defend you. So what is those great charges that Satan is doing? You know what? The great thing about the Lord if this is a courtroom session, as if you are in the battle of the judiciary here, whenever Jesus handling a certain case, hallelujah, for sure, you will be in always on a winning side. Jesus Christ, so many cases he is handling, he has no loss at all. Amen? Hindi pa siya natatalo at never siyang matatalo. Amen? So why? What's the assurance? Because in the last section of verse 1, he is the righteous one. Jesus Christ, the righteous. This is the title reserved for Christ. Notice in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us for, from all our unrighteousness. That is why if we, we understand that we commit sin, we must quit to confess we must quit to repent because God is a forgiving God. Now, this is what we call a sinlessness, a holiness, which is in Christ. And Apostle John repeated it in, repeat it in 1 John 3, 5. You know, he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him, referring to Christ, there is no sin. That what makes him a great validation that indeed he is a forgiving God because he has no sin at all. So, brothers and sisters, Jesus was the Father's means of bringing righteousness to a people. Again, what's the first point? The deeds of the saints. Second point is the defense of our Savior. He is our advocate. And thirdly, and the last what qualifies Jesus as our advocate because the death of our Savior. Listen, in the last section of chapter 2, uh, verse 2, and he himself, referring to our Lord Jesus Christ, he did not make satisfaction, uh, sorry, he did our satisfaction of our sins because God as a righteous God requires a sacrificial that is necessary in order for to comply. Ano ba yung comply, comply that need to be comply, uh, to, 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 to comply yung sinless perfection. The, the bad thing is you and I are not qualified and only in Christ Jesus. Now take note, the Situagent translator used the same Greek translate, translation of propitiation. That's the word hilasmos. It means satisfaction, appeasement. It is a two-part act that involves appeasing the wrath of an offended person referring to God and being reconciled. So let me explain this, you, uh, this one to you. God the Father, as a righteous God, is being offended by a sinful man. And God the Father, in order that the sin of the sinful man to be satisfied, he demanded a sacrificial, which is only God understands the, the, what we call the requirement and the sinless perfection of Christ. 
So there is a tendency in order to remove that anger from the wrath of God. Now he required Jesus for you and me. Our sins refers to the sin of all the believers and of course included the whole world. It means to say God really designed or desire to save all human person, humankind. He desired it. But whether we admit it or not, brothers and sisters, the teachings of the Bible, not all will be saved. Did you know that this verse is one of the highly debatable? Because what we call, there is what we call a definite atonement, unlimited atonement. And that's really the Bible teaches only the elect will be saved. Does the Bible really teaches that God will save all people? And again, you know, that's why we are not interpreting the scripture in a single verse alone. We must teach the Bible in, in connection to the 66 books in the Bible. So in other words, this is the reality. Christ's death made eternal life available to all, but not automatic for all. I will repeat it again. Christ's death is available to all, but not automatic for all. That is why this soteriological term was keep on repeat. John, as you know, as a great apostle, he repeated it in 1 John 4.10. Please, next slide, please. Inulit nyo ito in order to put an emphasis the value of the death of Christ, of Christ Jesus that is enough, that is sufficient for man's salvation. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. He repeated. Now take note. Let me just give you a theological uh, lesson here. In order to understand this soteriological term, Apostle Paul also teach us how a believer will be saved in justification. Okay, According to Romans 3, verses 24 to 25, it says here, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in God's merciful restraint, he let the sins previously committed to go unpunished. Now, I highlighted there the three soteriological terminology, justified, redemption, and propitiation. So notice these three different words. I will explain it further. Next slide, please. You will notice here, please uh, study it carefully and under is, understand this one. God the Father, if you will see in your screen, God the Father justified the sinner. Okay? That's God the Father and the sinner. He justifies us. You will notice there what happened in the center. The, te the death of Jesus Christ in the cross is the redemption. Now, in God the Father and God the Son, there, what we call propitiation. God the Father satisfy the perfect or sinless perfection that satisfy the requirement of God. That is what we call propitiation. What about the word redemption? It is now the relationship between the sinner and the Savior. So you will understand this one, that indeed God the Father justifies us because the wages of sin is that instead that you and I should die, but God, uh, God the Son will be the one to, to die in our behalf. And God the Father who initiated that. And now the word redemption actually... Christ Jesus, he wants us to reconcile through Christ in his behalf. 
That is why whenever we study the Bible, redemption, reconciliation, repentance, recompense, regeneration, rejoice, and redeem. God is saying, I want you to go back with me. Amen? God is always and the one that will initiate to come with him. It is not that you are good. It is not that you are kind. It is not good that you did everything for the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, the product of good works always begin that Christ Jesus saved you first. You should realize that. Otherwise, it will give glory to me rather than glory to God. So now, in John, in 1 John chapter 2, he is reminding this great four. That is why so powerful in verses 1 and 2, it corresponds until the last verse in John chapter 2, uh, 1 John chapter 2, one must renounce sin. That's 1 John 1, 8 to 1 John 2, 2. We must obey God. John chapter 2, verses 3 to 11, that will be tackled next week. We must reject worldliness, verses 12 to 17, and we must keep the faith, that verses 18 to 29. And these are the manifestation that we live in the light of God's presence. Hallelujah. Hopefully, you've learned something for tonight's preach, uh, today's preaching. Now, next slide, please. The word for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those who are in the world. This is what I'm saying earlier, that many Bible scholars are debating. Many people believe in the doctrine of universalism. No wonder they keep on living. Oh, it's okay. God loves me. Oh, it's okay. God, you, you know, God is so, so, so you know, uh, helpful to me in spite of uh, the continuous sins that I did. That is why when they understand the word universalism, take note. If you embrace this verse alone, but in the teaching of the Bible, you, that is not true. That is why, you know, I believe that in all the people on earth, 100% I believe all will not be saved. That is why there's a word of distinction here, but, that's the word but, that is why there's dark, there's darkness. Oh, sorry, there's dark and there's light. There's good and there's evil. There's what we call uh, 10 virgins, 5 are saved, 5 are not. And what we call there are goats and there are sheep, there are wheat and there are tares. There is always a resemblance and there is always a distinction. The question is to where you belong. And hopefully you are belong in the light. And the word believers refer to the contextually speaking in verse 1 to the little children. That's you and me. A reading and studying and embracing, trusting his life in Jesus. Now, in a further study, if you will notice uh, previous studies natin, verses 6, 8 to 10, those are people who claims to be with the fellowship of God, but they are not confessing their sins. So it refers to verses 7 to 9 in 1 John. So the conclusion of this today's sermon, mga kapatid, Every Christian should realize that in God's salvation, we need to understand the double cure. Uh, take note, we, we must understand the person and the works of Christ. And what is the result of that propitiation? I want you to embrace this great teaching in the Bible. Listen to this. The result of justification, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Before, the anger of or the wrath of God was in the sinners, but because we have Jesus now, we have peace with God. That is the primary result of this propitiation. There is peace from God. Secondly, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ According to Romans 8, verse 1, take note that these are the famous verse that we keep on saying, no, God will not condemn me, or in spite of the accusation of Satan, I know part of God's love. Yes, he justified me, but there's a big but. 
Yes, although God will not condemn you, this is not the license to commit sin. Do you understand? Yes, it's easy to accept that there is no condemnation. And yet, do you think you are free to commit sins? I don't think so. That is, God and that is part and parcel of God's grace in your life, in our life. Why he said that we are not condemned in order for us to have confidence to live in a righteous ma in an, in a righteous life. And thirdly, this is one of the great things that, that exalt the name of Christ and it serves as our uh, excitement. Romans chapter 8, verse 30, 8, 31 to 35. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for all of us, how will he not also with him freely give us these things? Who will bring charges against God's elect? Do you notice that? No one. That is why if you study the last verse of chapter 8, even death, even persecution, even trials, no one can separate us from the love of Christ. Tribulation. Trouble, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. Brothers and sisters, this, us, this is what makes us confident in Christ. That no one can separate us. No one can charge against us. Alam niyo mga kapatid, way back in the courtroom session, sabi ni Satan, Oh, is this your child? Oh, is this a Christian? Whenever he accuses you, whenever he accuses us, Ito lang ang sasabihin ni Lord. Sorry, God the Father, and pointing to Satan, bayad na yan. It's already settled. You know? Ganun lang simple. Anong ginangawa mo? What you are saying there? What you are keep on gossiping? This is my child. And they are so dear to me. Can you say amen for that? We are so special to the Lord. So in application, mga kapatid, what happens to us? that the reality is we commit sin, we must quick, quick to confess our sins because he is always forgiving because he is a righteous God. Every Christian should realize what we call the, do the double cure of the gospel. Now, let me share with you this another term of salvation or what we call soteriology, justification. It is a one-time act to God that makes us legally righteous through Christ. It is a deliverance from the penalty of sin. That is why Satan will not accuse you now. No? He will not accuse you because it's already passed. It was already justified. So it was already accomplished at the cross of Calvary. On the other side, this is what we call sanctification. It is a continual process by which God is actually making a process or making a person righteous. As I've said earlier, it is the Holy Spirit through the word of the living God that will sanctify us. I like the word of Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Whenever we face, whenever we read the Bible, we see, we, ga we gaze the glory of Christ. That is why it says here, we are being changed just glory by glory by glory. Why? Because whenever we read the Bible, we are seeing ourselves in according to the image and the conformance of Christ Jesus. That is why it is so profitable, it is so helpful whenever a Christian read the Bible. Sa Tagalog or sa Bisaya, lagi kang ginansya. You are always have a prophet. So keep on reading, keep on study, and keep on fellowship with other believers in order to grow in the knowledge of grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the way you spend time fellowship with the believers today, brothers and sisters, you are just obeying to what God and what the Bible is saying. I praise God for your life that in spite of this two or two and a half fellowship, you invest time reserved for heaven. Can you give a clap offering for that if you are still there, if you are not sleeping? No, I'm just kidding. So always remember this. If you claim to be a born-again Christian, but you continually and habitually involved in a casual sex outside marriage, 
So the question is, is it possible that you deserve you deceive yourself into thinking, oh, okay, I'm a Christian, I am in Christ, and yet you have been through the gospel, but take note, the gospel has not done yet in you. So it is a paramount to understand between the distinction of justification and this sanctification. It's already finished. That sancti that justification, we are now in the process of sanctification. That is why in understanding of interpretation the Bible, we must understand, uh, I am in the section of justification for sure. I am in the, in, the, in, the, in the aspect of sanctification and majority in the epistles, majority of the letters always in the sanctification mood. Because sort of saying, always remember, I am preaching today, no? It is always involves in two category or aspect. I keep on preaching, edifying the saints. I keep on preaching for what? Evangelizing the soul or the lost. Two things that always involves in preaching, evangelizing the lost and edifying the saints. That is why whenever we hear the word of God as if our, you know, our spirit is being ignited. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Thank you, Jesus, for this great reminder that indeed I am unique. I, I believe that, you know, the, that God who called me is the one that will protect me even until to the last breath that I will have. So this term, both can be used inseparably and it should have a simultaneous effect by the precious blood of the Lamb. What's the application of today's sermon, brothers and sisters? According to 2 Corinthians, take note, 2 Corinthians 13.5. Now, balik tayo in my introduction. Why? What is the involvement of the series of tests in the life of that concrete? Did you know that as a believer, we are always in the pro in in the process of testing now listen to the, to this verse second corinthians 13 5 to 6 test yourself now i want you to speak in your own test yourself to see if you are in faith please test your faith baka mamaya eh nagsasabi tayo we are kept on saying yeah i'm a christian and yet if you are about to, to be tested, you will fail. Examine yourself. Or do you not recognize this about yourself? That Jesus Christ is in you. Unless indeed you fail the test. This is one of the saddest part in a Christian life. We keep on claiming that I am a Christian. But if time will come, we will be under testing. We will fail. That's a sad reality. But verse 6, but I expect that you will realize that ourselves do not fail the test. Amen? You are part of it. Even though you will undergo testing, you are rest assured that you will pass the test. So according to 1 Corinthians 10.13, as I've said earlier, this is the assurance that God gives us to each one of us. No temptation has overtaken you except something that is common to mankind. And God is faithful, so he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way to escape also, though that you will able to endure. My dear brothers and sisters, the reality is, yes, we will experience trials. Yes, we will experience temptations. But one thing is for sure, God will give something for you to endure. Can you say thank you for that? The good thing about testing, it will test the kind of faith that you have. It will test what kind of character you have. It will test that you are a really genuine believer of Jesus. A word of advice, always examine ourselves. A word of advice, always test yourself. And what's the title of today's message? Test of Knowing Christ. Each Christian should undergo a series of tests in order to prove that we are a genuine Christian so that the world will see that we are a children of light and we are a children of God. So before I end, what my challenge for you, mga kapatid, remember in the courtroom session, this is the word of assurance. Whatever the final verdict by God the Father, sasabihin niya, no? Boom! And when you have Jesus as our advocate, what do you think happened to your case? We will always be 
a winner. Wow! We will always be a winner. If you are in Jesus, you are always on the winning side. That's a promise that we must and rest assured it, He will do it because He is faithful. So as I end, mga kapatid, now tell me, what is the asset test now in today's life that we have? Paano masusubok na lumalago ang pamumuhay kristyano mo? How do you gauge your Christian life today? Now, this is a classic and practical example. Next slide, please, as I close. How's your love? How's your joy? How's your peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, you know, the gentleness? Do you think, are you more loving now? Do you have a joyful, joyful heart in spite of what's happening in the world today? Do you have more peace? How patient you are now? Do you feel more kindness? Or tamad ka pa rin gumawa ng kabutihan sa iba? Do you feel more goodness? Kamusta ang pamumuhay na meron ka? Or do you still, are you, are you more faithful now? Are you more gentle now? That in spite of pressure that we are facing today, you remain meek, you remain gentle? So uh, share ko lang, no? in spite of the challenges, na dina, nadadala ng ati ko because of our problem of my house in Das Marinas and my wife always asking me, buti ikaw, no? You handle that pressure. Because I understand that if God will test me, this is a practical test that I, I need to check. What is and how the fruit of the Holy Spirit that dwells in your life? What about your self-control? Mainitin pa rin ba ang ulo mo? In spite of the delayed salary, Tinatamad ka bang magpuri kay Lord? What about yung pangangamusta ng asawa mo? Kailan ka bang magpapadala? Do you have a self-control to explain anything for them? This practical advice, so the question is, through our actions in life today, am I growing in my personal walk with the Lord? I will pose for a minute and I am questioning today to those people listening this sermon, are you growing in the Lord? Do you really growing in the Lord? As a human behavior, this changes in our lives. We must claim to be a real born again Christian. It should manifest in our daily lives in a daily basis. This is the challenge that I will leave it to you. Can we honestly say, Lord, more than anything else, help me to be filled in the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, hopefully you are being blessed by the message. We, are, we have an advocate and the propitiation of the blood of Christ is always the center of our heart. Glory to God for his message. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful verses the verse that you are reminding us. Thank you, Lord, the power of the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you keep on saying, you are my child. No one can accuse you. You are my children. No one can, can charge you. I pray, oh, Father God, for those people listening to this sermon, Lord, to empower them, to enlighten them. And Lord, I pray, as you said in Isaiah 11, God, you speak in your word, the spirit of might, the wisdom, the counsel, Lord, the spirit of the fear of the Lord be upon them. And I pray, O oh Father God, as you said in 2 Peter chapter 3, 18, that we must grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father God, as a word of assurance, as you said in Psalm 19, 1, He who dwells in the most sacred high shall abide under the shadow of Almighty God. Thank you, Lord, that you are our refuge. And Lord, we will pay uh, a certain time of prayer, I pray, Lord God, the spirit of peace, Lord, to touch the heart of uh, President Vladimir Putin. And for those people, Lord, spare the people of the innocent people living in Ukraine. And Lord, the spirit of unity and Lord, the spirit of intercession that we are not just live according to the conformance and image to our Lord Jesus Christ, but Lord, we design as a church, Lord, to intercede in your behalf. This is the greatest uh, ministry that you have given to each one of us. Lord, 
I lift your name on high, for you alone the glory, the power, the authority, the dominion. This is my prayer and thanksgiving in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless us all.